Right now I'm talking with Shyla Harper, who is in my hometown of Detroit, Michigan. She is a nurse at Veterans Hospital there in Detroit, and she is just recovering from the coronavirus, almost lost her life because of COVID-19. Shyla, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling fantastic. I'm feeling great today. I am so much better. That's wonderful. I, I First of all, I just want to say thank you for your service. You are one of those frontline workers uh, putting your life on the line to keep other people safe and to save the lives of so many people. So I just want to say thank you very much for your service. And I know that um, this has been a really rough time for you. So yeah. let me, let, let's go back. So how, how long have you been a nurse? I've been at the VA for seven years. Um, I've been working in nursing for over 10 years. And right now, actually at the VA, I'm on a long-term care unit. Um, and I take care of some very well-decorated veterans. Oh, wow. And that's their home. That's where they live. That's amazing. That's amazing. When did you start hearing about the coronavirus and COVID-19? I actually had only heard about it maybe a week before I got sick. What was the first thing that you were feeling? I started feeling like I had the flu, but I knew because I've had the flu before, mm -hmm. I knew that this was something a little different. So um, that's when I went and got tested. I so started you, feeling the fevers, the mm -hmm. body ache. Did you take your own temperature at that time? Yes. Yeah, so and I what was it? 103. Oh, wow. Yes. So you knew something was wrong. Yes, I did. You have two daughters at home, right? Yeah. Two daughters at home. You also have a son. He doesn't live with you, but I'm sure you were concerned at that time for your children. Yes, I was because I also have an 11 year old that's here with me that has asthma. So I knew the virus was going around and I knew how it affects the respiratory system and she has asthma. So you have this fever, you go get tested and then what happens? Do you go back home? So they told me to quarantine for seven days or until I got my test results. So I was home under quarantine during that time. And tell me what were your symptoms when you went back home to quarantine? You had the fever still and what else did you have? I had these terrible body aches, like from my neck all the way, the soles of my feet hurt when I walked, my fingers hurt. I had terrible headaches, um, um, abdominal pains, wow. um, the fevers, the chills, everything. Had you ever felt like that before? Never, never. I've never been that ill before. So now you go back to the hospital and then what happens? So I got back to the hospital and it was during that time, you know, they were in valley and cars. So I had to park my car and it was just a struggle just walking from my car to ER. So they met me with the wheelchair and I, at that point, my oxygen level was low. Um, they, I couldn't, I could barely breathe and they started doing critical care on me um, right there in the ER. I had to get on oxygen almost immediately when I got there. My vitals were very unstable and they admitted me that day. You must have been scared to death. I mean, you must have been just yeah. out of your mind with worry because here it is your mother. You're only, what, 43? Yes. 43. Do you have any of, you know, they say people with underlying health conditions, but anything that would have contributed to you getting so sick so quickly? No, I don't have any underlying health conditions. Um, I'm not a smoker. So the way it attacked my respiratory system, it was just shocking. All right. So they, they admit you into the hospital, they give you oxygen. And then after that, what happens? So it was just um, a nightmare. Um, it was like after that, I, I, I kept having um, issues with my respiratory system. I was diagnosed with respiratory failure, severe sepsis, 
um, pneumonia in both my lungs. Um, I was severely dehydrated because at this point I had lost 11 or 12 pounds because I couldn't eat. I didn't have an appetite. And so um, I couldn't drink. I was severely dehydrated and I just could not breathe. And you had, every day was a struggle. You had respiratory failure, pneumonia, and sepsis. Yes. Any of those could have killed you. Right, right. Sepsis, you know, your organs begin to shut down. So um, I went into respiratory failure and it was, it was just very scary. It's scary when you can't breathe. It's like someone is suffocating you. You know, many patients talk about the feeling of isolation and the fact that your family can't be there to hug yeah. you, to talk to you. To, what was that period like mentally for you, um, being separated from your from your daughters and just not being able to have that that interaction? It was hard. It was very hard because even um, on top of not being with my family, not having any visitors. I didn't know what my nurses or my doctors even looked like, you know, all I saw was face shields and masks. You know, there was a point where I was very emotional crying and my doctor just said, I wish I could hug you, but I can't. It was very hard, very lonely, very scary. A lot of praying during that time? A lot of praying, a lot of praying because I, I thought I was going to die. I had made my peace with it because it was a very hard struggle. At some point, um, you know, you said, I'm going to try to fight this as much as I can. What did you do that you think helped with your own recovery? In addition to the prayer, what do you think? What was that turning point, that moment for you? Um, I started wanting to do things independently and do things that were more difficult. Um, they had gave me um, a bedside commode, but because it was so difficult for me to walk to the bathroom, it was so difficult. Um, my oxygen was lowering, but I told them, let me walk. Let me do things on my own. Let me sit up in my chair. Um, the virus makes you want to just lay in bed and just just lay there. And so I wanted to get up. I, I forced myself out of bed every day. Mm -hmm. That must have been really, here it is, they're giving you oxygen and you're still saying that you want to get out of bed. Yes. And I even, um, um, one of my nurse recalled in, an, in a separate interview how um, respiratory was called in three times in one day for me. But even during that time, I still said, please just let me do this by myself. You know, let me get dressed on my own because at that point, everything was a struggle for me. Bathing, um, just getting dressed on my own, doing things for myself that I would normally do on a daily basis. You were in the hospital the same time as your former mother-in-law was in the yes. hospital. Yes, yes. My um, my Nana, um, Yvonne Harper, and myself and my and her son Vincent, we all were in the hospital at the same time. And this is my daughter, my eleven year old's daughter, my eleven year olds. This is her family that's in there. So she's worried about her mommy, she's worried about her Nana, and she's worried about her uncle at the same time. And we all had COVID. And unfortunately, your mother in law did not make it no no she didn't she was on a ventilator and she was actually getting better um i had spoke to my daughter's dad just the day before and they were weaning her off of the oxygen and so all of us were just so hopeful we were very hopeful and it was just devastating because she's a matriarch of the family you know and she's so well loved by everyone her church her um everyone that knew her loved her very much did she pass away while you were still in the hospital she passed away three days after i got home mm -hmm. so during my recovery i had to deal with that and it was so difficult because when i i was the one that told my daughter and i couldn't hug her 
I still couldn't hug her because when I came home, I was still on a 14 day isolation. That is, yeah. It's just so heartbreaking. What did doctors say in terms of what was it about you that enabled you to beat this virus? Well, um, they really pushed me to number one, start, start, I had to start eating. Mm -hmm. um, I had to force myself to start eating because with the virus, a lot of times you don't have an appetite. So that was one thing I had to build my strength back up. And then they gave me an apparatus called a spirometer that I had to breathe into um, 10 times every hour. Mm -hmm. And um, they were pushing me to do that. And I just had to do everything that they told me that I needed to do, not lay down in the bed, sit up straight um, and try to do things on my own if I could. And what was that moment like for you, Shiloh, when you were able to go back home and actually see your daughters? It was probably one of the happiest moments of my life. Um, just being separated from my family and going through that experience, a near-death experience, it's just one I will never forget. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so you had to be quarantined when you got home. And... Yeah but there was a moment you were actually physically able to hug your daughter. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it was April 15th. I oh, you remember the date, uh-huh. <laughs> yes, April 15th, I was actually able to embrace my daughters and I was able to leave out of the house for the first time just to grab some Qdoba and, <laughs> and come back home and it just felt good. It was different being out you know, because I had not been around everyone with the social distancing. So I had to get used to being away from people and used to seeing the masks on everyone. It's very surreal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is. Now you walk around and everybody has a mask on now. So one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you, Shiloh, was because we don't hear from a lot of African-American women who have have battled this disease, this virus. We don't hear these stories. Um, my message is that this is a very, very serious and a very deadly virus. Um, I encourage, you know, especially women that look like me to um, do a better job of taking care of yourselves. Mm -hmm. um, let's stay healthy, eating right, um, staying away from things that are toxic um, and just really abiding by the guidelines that are set um, in our state. I know that some states are opening, um, but the virus is still real. It's still, um, it's very dangerous. And so we need to be careful. You don't know who the next person that you encounter has been around or who that person has been around. Right. So and it's very easy to spread. As women, we are the caretakers. So we are the ones who are usually caring for other people. And how do you balance those roles as the person who is the caretaker, but also taking care of herself? Right. And so me, I'm, I'm here, I'm being a mom. My daughter, she just started online classes. Um, I have another daughter that's um, finishing up her degree in mortuary science. And so I have to help my daughter with her work. Um, I have to help my other daughter with the things that she needs, but there's a thing called self-love also. And I have to pay attention to the things that are going on within my own body. And it's important for us as mothers, especially African-American mothers, because we don't do that all the time. And it's this, this thing, I, I hope it's eye-opening for everyone to just take care of themselves better. Right. Well, Shyla Harper, I am so happy that you are, um, you know, that you are well today and that you are taking care of yourself. Um, your message is so important. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you for having me. Okay. All right, hon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.